You know, and, and he explains that it wasn't for the same reasons that, that the likes of Kaidis and Flea and Slovak became drug addicts, you know, as a having a good time, you know, being out, being sociable, you know. It was because he was, he'd been very depressed ever since he was a child. He, he, he heard voices in his head, he had mental health issues, and <coughs> being in the band at that point had brought them out and made things even more difficult for him. And he, he self-medicated, you know. What, you know, he tried to take the voices away by obliterating himself. When I joined the band, I couldn't believe that they, like, wanted to be this other thing than they were, mm. you know. Like, they didn't think, like, I thought of them as huge stars, you know. But to them, they weren't famous yet, you know, and they weren't, they hadn't made it yet. And they wanted to be as big as Aerosmith or whatever, you know. And I couldn't, like, that was a shock, yeah. But I, it didn't bother me. I was happy as hell. But but it, but I I hoped that we would stay at the level that we were at in popularity. It, it had never entered my head. It was never a thought that went through my head that said, people are going to buy this and listen to it. A lot of people all over the world. Like when I first said it, I said all over the country, and then I realized Jesus all over the world. I don't think that death is a big deal. I don't care if I die right now. It doesn't mean I'm self-destructive. I, I really love life, and I think that's the only way to love life. Okay, you want me to say something soulful? Drugs, I'm a junkie, and I love shooting up, and, I'm, and that, that means I'm self-destructive, and, you know, is that good enough? <laughs> I don't know. Did you feel it was a true statement? Or? Yeah. Oh. He's holed up in this motel room, just like in this kind of weird twilight zone, just doing all the heroin, completely got lost in that kind of world. And you can't blame the kid, he's only a young kid, he's only about, he's, even then he's only about 23, 24. He's gone from being a nobody right into like one that, one, the band that's broken huge across the world. That's a tough break from the outside as well. He's got caught up in all the lifestyle. Well, well you would, you know. Like, you, it's like anybody, it's like people always sneer, it's vicious, but he was 21, you know, it's, it's, it's there on a plate, you're going to take it, you don't understand what it's going to do to you. People go, you think you're indestructible, and John Frusciante luckily found out just before that he wasn't indestructible, you know, he was, he was on the way to like Hillel Slovak, you know, to, to lose one guitar player, it's a tragedy, to lose two, he's just like, my God, what's going on here, you know. While Frusciante descended into the dark world of drugs and depression that would spawn a series of solo albums, his bandmates found a new guitarist, former Jane's Addiction man Dave Navarro. They had come too far to split now. Dave Navarro is, a, is a, I mean, the, the Chili Peppers keep getting great guitar players. There's, there's no two ways about it. I mean, they've got a good ear for, for, what, for what sounds good. Dave Navarro is a completely different kind of guitar player. He's like a much heavier guitar player. I mean, he was in, a, he's from Jane's Addiction, who are a great band. In some ways, a fellow travellers of the Chili Peppers, there's an intelligence there. There's an experimentation there. There's a mashing of different styles. They're both equally key LA bands that period to kind of sum up the music scene in that city. So he was like the obvious choice for the band really. I mean they, they got the, the guy that's you know you would never think they'd get him but he's the obvious guy to come in and step in. I admired Dave Navarro at the time because he was very honest even before he really recorded anything with the band that he did not like funk music, which is almost you know uh, antithesis of being a Chili Pepper. It's not to say that Navarro is a two-dimensional player. You know, he's he's very well versed um, in in many different uh, forms of music, but funk is is not certainly not his first love, and I think that really showed. And I think he takes a more a more structured. Um, approach to composition and playing 
which didn't necessarily fit with the, with the Chili Peppers way of doing things. But also having said that, the Chili Peppers is, is probably a very hard gang to join. You know, as any group like that, it's been so close knit for so long. Um, and they're all good guys, but I don't think that was a good personality match. People are back on one hot minute, it's not been the best of the like Pierre Chili Peppers records, but it's actually some really good moments. I mean, Aeroplane is a really fantastic song. And the, one, and the other great thing about Chili Peppers is they've always had a really real command of melody. I mean, they, they write melody as good as the Beatles ever did. I mean, that's, they are really great tunes for the Chili Peppers, which kind of gets lost and all up, up to the last two albums with that kind of period. People like looked at them as kind of frat boy humour, you know, the party bands, great grooves, great band, great fun to go and see live. This kind of really mad sense of humour kind of thing going on. People forget they actually write really great tunes and aeroplanes got a really fantastic, beautiful melody in it. Um, it, it's the, definitely the underrated uh, lost Red Hot Chili Peppers album. Um, Except for the fact that I think it was like number two in Britain and number four in America. So everybody sort of says, well, it's flopped, but it just totally didn't. Um, and uh, it, it's a really, really great multi-textured, multi-layered record, which did take things on from Blood Sugar, Sex Magic to Californication. Um, it brought in more psychedelic influence. Um, it, there were more vocal harmonies on it. Uh, it had more texture in it. Um, it we saw them getting further and further away from the funk metal thing. Um, and it really is a complete transition record and, and, and a very, very, very good one. And probably out of all the Red Hot Chili Peppers albums, it's probably the one which, which sort of begs re repeated listening. You know, whereas most of the rest of the albums, they hit you in the face straight away with what they are and they kind of stick that way. Um, I think one hot minute, you take six, seven, ten, twelve listens to really unwrap it all. And I like records like that and I think a lot of people did. Though a fantastic guitarist, Navarro didn't really fit the bill. After debuting with the band at Woodstock 1994, it soon became apparent he had a different method of working, which was too structured and thought out for the Chili Peppers. This was the sticking point for the band and the problem with his one album with them when One Hot Minute was released in 1995. The record was met with a mixed response. I think it's very difficult when the band write off an album, I mean, you know, this happened to the Lars with their first album, this happened to the Beta Band with their first album. If a band pretty much write off a particular album they've made, um, then the press and, and the public go along with them. I mean, if they're not saying it's great, then, you know, it becomes accepted wisdom. Oh, this was crap. Um, I think they, they wrote it off because, because they weren't in a happy place at the time, um, because Navarro hadn't worked out, and because there was a lot of regret over John Frusciante. After one hot minute, Anthony decided to journey across India alone. On his travels, horrified by the permeation of the California dream into all cultures, he conceived the title track to what will be their next album, Californication. Good job the talented and much missed John Prashanti would be there to help realize his creative ideas. Dave Navarro is a, uh, a very fine player and he's a consummate rock star, but obviously the chemistry wasn't there. And John brings a lot of instinctive musicality. And John's playing is very, uh, very kind of free form, and he uses a lot of uh, clean tones, which you wouldn't necessarily associate with a band, a high-energy band like the Chili Peppers. And uh, 